All right, middle schoolers. So I don't know about you guys, but last week was kind of a tough week for me. And then the announcement came out that we're not gonna see each other for the rest of the school year, which made me really sad. So <laughs> Rue was frantically trying to tear apart her perch. Um, so I decided this week, um, and I, I had to think long, long and hard about it because I wanted to come up with something that, that we could all just enjoy doing. So this week, um, I wanted to laugh a lot. I feel like um, I feel like it would just be good to take a break from all the heavy stuff going on and just take a break and laugh. So this week is laughter week, and I wore my shirt. Normally, I wear this post concert. Life makes me happy. If you can see that. There we go. It's a little better. Anyway, um, normally I wear this after every concert because um, I'm always happy when the concert's over because it normally goes off very well and it's just a lot of stress off my plate. But um, I wore this today because I think we could all use a little bit of happiness. So um, we're going to pause on our game that we normally play each week. And this week, instead, I wanted to read you um, a, a funny story, a funny short story that my mom read to me and my siblings when we were about your age um, that I thought was really funny. So a little synopsis. Synopsis is a fancy word for a little overview before we get started. Um, this is from a book called Kerplunk and the author's name is Patrick McManus and he does a lot of funny stuff and some of you parents might be going, oh, I know that guy and a lot of you maybe not. Um, so, um, he tells a lot of stories about, um, how he grew up and funny stories about his adventures with his buddies. Um, and he talks a lot about fishing and camping and hunting. So if you've ever done any of those things, you'd probably find them really funny. This one though, talks about his dog. Um, I won't give too much away, but, um, any of you who have a dog, especially a dog who sleeps in your room will understand this. I had a dog growing up. She was a big standard poodle. So she was like a big poodle. Um, and her name was Nadia and she would sleep in my room when I was um, growing up. And sometimes she would eat stuff that would make her stomach not feel so great. And then well, to put it delicately, things would get stinky. And my parents didn't want her stinking up the living room. So guess where she got sent? My bedroom. And that was kind of miserable to sleep with. So um, anyway, that being said, this is a story about him and his dog, Patrick's dog, and uh, the silly adventures of uh, the difficulties that dogs can present sometimes. So here it is. And I've got it on my Kindle. So I don't have an actual, I don't have the actual book, but I've got it on my Kindle. So I'll read you my Kindle today. It's called <laughs> Silent But Deadly. <clears throat> Although I've always made an effort to avoid gross and insensitive topics in these discourses, I believe the time has come for me to take a serious look at dog flatulence. And for those of you who don't know, flatulence is a fancy term for passing gas. When I say look, I don't mean that, except in extreme cases, you can actually see dog flatulence, but only that it deserves some study, particularly by those of us who share with bird dogs the enclosed cab of a vehicle. First of all, when these unfortunate occurrences take place, you should not yell at the dog. It will do no good and will only make matters worse. The dog, too, is suffering, as is perhaps obvious when he shoots you that pained little grin. You okay there? There's no point in making him feel worse than he already does. The reason this terrible topic has come to mind is that the other day I was passed on the highway by some friends of mine returning from a pheasant hunt and driving well over the speed limit. Don't drive over the speed limit. Not only did the dogs have their heads hanging out the vehicle windows, so did the hunters. It was a practice I myself have engaged in from time to time while hunting with my dog, Clem, the recalcitrant. Nevertheless, I think it extremely unsafe procedure and decided that I should write a piece in which I offer a remedy for this unfortunate malady, one that contributes to so much of the downside of bird hunting. After contemplating the matter for several hours, however, and even with Clem under my desk, his dog, doing his best to keep my mind upon the topic, I was unable to come up with a remedy or a solution to the problem. So my only useful advice is this, live with it. 
My contemplation, nevertheless, reminded me of a social disaster perpetrated by my miserable old dog, Strange, whom I more or less owned during my teenage years. I will relate that catastrophe here instead. Back in time. My mother had named the dog Stranger in the hope, as she later claimed, that he was just passing through. He wasn't. He stayed on for a dozen years, biting the hands that fed him, those hands usually belonging to my grandmother. He was the kind of dog that, had he been a human, would probably have made his living as a loan shark working out of the trunk of his car. A relatively small dog of mixed breed and possibly of mixed species, he possessed a high degree of intelligence, which, as far as anyone ever noticed anyway, he never put to the service of the family that had taken him in. Indeed, he had our house, had our house caught fire. The arson investigators might have come up with a standard photo of the crowd of spectators, one of whom might be the arsonist himself. In the front row, I'm quite sure, would have been a little brown and white dog, a look of bemusement on his face, and possibly a can of kerosene next to him. I don't mean to imply that Strange, as his name was eventually and more appropriately shortened to, was the worst dog in the world, but if you were to reverse the Boy Scout motto, you would pretty much define his character. Untrustworthy, disloyal, unhelpful, etc. The event in question began shortly after my family had stuffed itself with a typical Thanksgiving dinner. I laid suffering, <laughs> I laid suffering on the couch in deep remorse over my recent gluttony and regretting that I had asked my former girlfriend, Olga Bone Marrow, probably a made-up name, I'm hoping that's a made-up name, to go to a movie with me that evening. I couldn't even consider breaking the date because it was my first one since Olga and I had broken up, had, since Olga had broken up with me the last time. She severed our relationship, as she explained, because she thought we should, we should, oops, because she thought we should each start dating other people, and that also because I was insensitive, inimaginative, inane, ignorant, and gross. I vaguely heard my grandmother call to my mother, What do you want me to do with this lull, this leftover turkey gravy? Mom replied, Whatever. Then I heard Graham open the door to the utility room, where a strange resided during cold weather. If it occurred to me that it might be a very bad idea to feed turkey gravy to a dog, I don't recall. Maybe because I could foresee no consequences for me. The next parameter of the disaster was a mountain car my friend Wretch Sweeney and I had brought together to use our, on our camping trips. The car had come without a back seat, as well as without brakes, headlights, taillights, spare tires, various windows, tailpipe, muffler, front fenders, and assorted other accessories. The partition between the back seat and the trunk had either rusted out or had been cut out by us. I can't recall which. It was inside this convenient space that we stored all our camping gear, sleeping bags, tarps, etc., and in which we sometimes slept out of concern for the elements, primarily bears, wolves, cougars, and snakes. We named the car Miss Peabody in honor of our favorite high school English teacher. Now, you must try to visualize this next part, as I myself had to do in reconstructing the scene of this crime. Strange is slurping up, his massive serving of turkey gravy, augmented with other, turkey, with other Thanksgiving edibles. Finished, he is booted out into the cold by Graham. Shortly thereafter, he begins to inflate. His skin grows taut over his body which expands until it gradually envelops his legs up to his paws. Only half of his tail protrudes. He takes on the appearance of a small, hairy zeppelin. A zeppelin's like a flying balloon. Slowly, he rises off the ground. Using his paws as flippers and the tip of his tail as a rudder, he floats around the house until he arrives at Miss Peabody, the mountain car. He enters through an open window. Then he snuggles down under the camping gear and, presumably, goes to sleep. He is a ticking time bomb. It was about this time that I said to my mother, Well, it's almost time to go pick up Olga. I finally got the snow scraped off Miss Peabody, started her up, and drove her to the bone marrows. Olga came out of the house wearing a coat with fur collar and matching fur hat, and she was truly a vision of loveliness. her thick blonde hair cascading down over her shoulders and her blue eyes sparkling in the crisp cold air. My heart leaped at the sight of her. It was hard to imagine that this was the same girl who for a few brief years earlier threw me down, grabbed my ears, and beat up my head up and down on the ground. She was carrying a flat, open box of pastries. What's that for? I asked, hopefully. 
Oh, she said, her honeysuckle voice. There's some pastries mother and I made for the church bake sale tomorrow. Mind if we drop them off on the way to the movie? Not at all. That's just so nice of you and your mom helping out the poor, I replied sensitively. We headed off towards the church. You look very nice this evening, I said attentively. Thank you, she replied. You have a nice Thanksgiving, I said, trying to avoid the inane. Very nice, she said. And you? Oh, yes, indeed. Very nice. We were about halfway to the church when Strange suddenly, silently, sinisterly deflated. Just think about that for a second. Later, trying to reconstruct the event, I thought I might have heard a faint whoosh. But by then I had suffered so much brain damage I couldn't be sure. Olga and I were instantly engulfed by a plume of fumes so powerful it fogged my glasses and sent tears streaming down my face. If Miss Peabody had had a speed faster than seven miles an hour, I might have driven off the road. On the plus side, though, the fume ate most of the rust off my dashboard. I couldn't believe this was happening. Naturally, as far as I was at the moment aware, there could be only one suspect for this atmospheric atrocity. My eyes streaming tears, I glanced at the suspect. Her eyes bored into me like a matched pair of stilettos. Now remember, he doesn't know Strange is in the back of the car. Her face glowed a fiery red. She is obviously embarrassed, I thought, and rightfully so. I was about to blurt out a gross comment when I suddenly caught myself. No point in risking another breakup, even though at the moment Olga's appeal had somewhat diminished for me. I tried frantically to come up with something sensitive to say, something attentive, something that wasn't gross. The box of pastries on her lap drew my attention. There was a particularly large cherry tart sitting on top. I leaned over and nodded at it, pretending I'd noticed absolutely nothing of an olfactory nature, meaning something you can smell. You do that big one? I choked out. Driving home alone shortly thereafter, or not quite alone because the true villain had emerged by then to take, to take as much credit for the ruckus as he could, I was pulled over by Sheriff Bone Marrow, who just happened to be Olga's father. He hated Miss Peabody, the car, and from time to time had actually threatened wretching me with bodily harm if he caught us driving it on the highway again. Fortunately that night, I was on the back road. The sheriff took off, took off his hat and used it to fan his way through the black cloud of exhaust. What did you burn in this thing, he growled, wet leaves? It was his standard line. He glanced around inside of Miss Peabody. Where's Olga? I thought you and Olga were going to a movie tonight. Nah, Olga broke up with me again. But this time, the usual, inattentive, insensitive, inane and gross, particularly gross, women. He said, yeah, I said, women. One other thing, Patrick, what's that red stuff all over your face? Better not be lipstick. Cherry tart, I said, it's cherry tart. What happened was Olga grabbed the tart and the sheriff held out his hand. Stop. I don't want to know. One more thing, though. What's that? I asked. Why is your dog riding on the roof of the car? He looks half froze. Turkey gravy, I said. Graham fed him turkey gravy. Turkey gravy? Fed a dog turkey gravy in a populated area? I think that's a felony. I should go arrest her. I wish you would, I said. And there's the end. So I hope if that didn't give you some laughs, I hope it at least gave you a few chuckles. Um, so your assignment this week, check it out. Scroll down a little bit. Um, go read your assignment and it, post it to Padlet if you can. If you can't, if you're having trouble accessing Padlet, just send me an email. Okay. Um, also, there is a laugh challenge and uh, the laughing game that I want you to see if you guys can do this week. And that's all for this week. I hope you have a great week. I hope you enjoy laughing. And uh, Rue is actually very well behaved today. She's. <laughs> and have a wonderful week.